Hi, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for taking their time out of their day to uh, listen to my presentation. My name is John Erickson. I'm a PhD, PhD student at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Um, and this is my pa uh, presentation on the paper of the automatic grading of, open res of student open response questions in mathematics. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking my uh, very talented team that helped me throughout this process, um, Anthony, Steve, Ashvini, and uh, my advisor, Dr. Neil Heffernan. Uh, all their work uh, really supplemented our, our ability to work through this paper and really helped in every many different aspects. Um, I want to start off this presentation by uh, discussing computer-based learning platforms. Um, since this was the foundation of our data that we collected and what we use, I thought it was imperative to discuss what are the goals of a computer-based learning platform, uh, why, are, why are they beneficial, and why should we use them? Um, and so the overall goal of a learning of a lear computer-based learning platform is to supplement instructions um, to be able to provide assistance to students in a timely manner. It allows teachers to get reports quickly and efficiently and being able to summarize what their students are doing, how they're approaching problems, what are their common or wrong answers that they've given, um, and seeing what their progress is. And these platforms then collect this fine-grained student data for, and we're able to use this to develop research such as this. Um, and so what do they do well? As I discussed a second ago, these reports that they generate are very, very detailed. They're reported very timely back to the teachers so that they can get a deeper understanding of what the student under, has uh, done, what have the students, how have they approached it, what have they done wrong, what have they done correctly, what problem was right. Um, and this immediate feedback and support to students uh, is a strong aspect of these computer-based learning platforms. And this is all uh, capable, or these systems are capable of this and able to do this because of the type of questions they are asking. They ask questions that required well-structured um, well structured answers uh, when they're so for instance, when they're asking a question six times six, it's easy for a system to know that 36 is the answer it's looking for. Or a question that's saying solve for X, like the one we see here, uh, the system is able to easily understand that it's looking for either 0.5 or one half, so a decimal or a fraction. And these consist of also multiple choice and most often fill in the blank. So these are very well-structured questions. Uh, some platforms uh, have begun to utilize uh, this and to use this in the backbone of what their system is meant for. So assessments, the platform which we are using, um, was developed with the idea of providing immediate feedback to these students. Um, but what these systems also do that is advantageous when they generate these reports also is that they're able to identify the common wrong answers. So when we look at a question like this where they're trying to calculate the length of this line or the side of the triangle, the system can easily know 10 is the correct answer. But it also then can collect and understand, okay, a lot of people are saying 5, 16, AC, um, but it then knows, okay, student asks 16 often. You can have a built-in response that tells them, okay, you were close, but you need to try, you need to make sure you remember the 2x term. Uh, this system, these systems can provide that information. Uh, within these computer-based learning platforms, there has been, uh, a wider range of problems that they have begun supporting and obtaining. Um, there's a widespread now usage and common agreement of using these OER contents, these open educational resources for K through 12 mathematics. And these are commonly known, uh, it's common ones that people use are Engage New York or Illustrative Mathematics, which is a large group of questions that teachers can use to uh, supplement learning to their students and provide a wide range of content for students for free. Uh, and when looking at the problem types that these uh, certified on or these op open educational resources have, the content is, you know, a mixture of multiple choice, fill in the blank, but a large percentage of these OER content are open-ended questions. So when we look, when we discuss this, this is what a teacher may want to ask a question where the student has to solve for uh, another number. As we look at here, they, these are looking for these two numbers. But they also want to know what is the student 
thinking, how are they approaching the problem? What, how did they reach this answer? So instead of just putting the answer being eight or nine or whatever the answer may be, a student has to explain their reasoning, being able to say this, is, this was my process, and the teacher then gets a deeper look into what was the student experiencing, what were they thinking, what, what steps did they take. Uh, and with assessments, it is one of the few computer-based learning platform systems that can support this type of question. So a question that does have this explain your reasoning. This question was taken directly from assessments. With this, we wanted to explore and look at how many of these problems are teachers assigning, how many open response problems are assigned throughout the school year. And as we can see from this plot on the left here, is that teachers start off the semester or the school year uh, and by assigning a large, a decent amount of open response problems. But as the year progresses, the number of open response questions that are assigned uh, goes down pretty drastically. And we, this, what we have ascertained is that as the semester goes on, teachers get busier and busier. And since there's a lack of support provided by these computer-based learning platforms to be able to assist the teachers in grading these with automatic feedback, such as with uh, multiple choice questions where we know the answer, the teachers have to go through and answer all of the, read the responses, write out a response, answer them, and grade them. Very takes It's more time consuming. So then we also want to look at, okay, out of the problems that, out of the open response problems that have been assigned, what percentage of these problems have been graded, and what percentage have the teachers actually provided feedback? And what we were able to notice was that similarly, there's a downward trend in the amount of graded or amount of open response questions that have been graded. We can see that overall, it's only around 10% of the assigned uh, open response questions. Only around 10% of them are actually graded. And we can see that even a smaller amount, around 2% of these open response questions are even uh, given feedback to the students. So while there is a downward trend, it's small, but the overall amount of the open response questions being graded or provided feedback to students is very low. So they're giving them out, these questions out, but the time it takes to grade and provide feedback takes a long time. This, this observation uh, supported what we were hoping to try and explore. And we were hoping to look and see if we're going to be able to develop and evaluate models, which are going to be able to automatically assess or automatically grade stu student responses for uh, open-ended problems. So when we take in this text, are we able to accurately grade these students? Um, and we also wanted to be able to see not only are we able to grade it, but how well are we able to grade it given that the sample, given the sample size that we have? And as we increase our sample size, are we improving our ability to grade these students, or is there evidence showing that more data isn't helping and we need to change our modeling process? But we also, and then on top of that, we want to make sure we explore what is the variation amongst teachers in the way that they grade students. Uh, we wanted to make sure we account for and look into and understand how different our teachers grading students, which will lead to our pilot study here, where we were exploring the variation amongst graders. Um, as I was lightly discussing a second ago, the grading is in itself a subjective manner. And with systems like assessments that allow open-ended questions for teachers, the, they allow teachers to grade them manually. There isn't an automatic grade assigned to it. Um, there, and what that means is then there aren't any rubrics that the teachers are following. We don't have information on this is the criteria they use to provide this grade to a student. There isn't a rubric telling us this was the criteria they were looking at. So as a teacher is grading their students, we, are, we do not have the information on are they grading the students on their ability to how they're explaining their problem and they're really detailed. Are they grading it on effort? Are they taking into account grammar? Or are they taking into account just completeness? There's so many different approaches a teacher could be using. And we wanted to be able to see with these different variations in the approaches teachers take to grade their students, 
are we able to see that there is agreement amongst teachers or not when grading students? So in this study, we recruited 14 different teachers for between the grades of 6th, 7th, and 8th. Um, more, majority of these teachers were uh, 7th grade teachers. And we polled 125 student responses across three different problems. We would then randomly sample 25 responses across, or across these three problems and assign it to each one of the 14 teachers. We also made sure we set a caveat where each teacher was guaranteed 10 responses from their own students. So when we assigned the 25 responses, if a teacher only obtained five students of their own within the 25 responses, we made sure they, they got another five students of their own. Because when we pulled from this 125 student responses, they could get students from any of these other 14 teachers. So we wanted to make sure they always had 10 responses from their own students. So if they had eight students of their own in this 25, we would then add on additional two student responses from two of their students. And then from there, the teachers would grade these student responses. And through this process, teachers were grading the same student responses over time. So we were then able to directly compare teacher A, teacher B, and the way they are grading the students. Um, and so with this, we utilize a fleece cap of uh, value to be able to understand how much agreement is amongst the teachers when grading students. And what we were able to find was that on a five point scale of grading, the teachers were able to, were, have, were able to agree about 17% above random chance. So teachers were agreeing 17% of the time above random chance of what the student should be obtaining a grade of. So when we look at the grades on a scale of five, so the students were assigned a grade from zero to four, the teachers were only agreeing 17% of the time above random chance. So what we initially, or we decided to explore was, okay, how far off are they? Are they off by, you know, this teacher gives a grade of a one, but another teacher gave a grade of a two with the subjective manner, it, how far off? So we decided to group the grades to see, um, to consider, okay, maybe the teachers are off by one. So we made sure teachers that are grouped or that gave a zero or one are considered the same and teacher or grades that were given a two, three or four were considered the same. And then seeing how much there was agreement amongst teachers when considering these grouped grades. And from there, we saw an increase in our the teacher's uh, agreement amongst what the student should be provided for a grade. So we saw that instead of 17% of agreement above random chance, teachers were now able to, are now agreed 42% uh, per, above random chance of what the grade should be. So there's a 30% more agreement amongst teachers on what the student should receive a grade of. Um, and then we also had the unique opportunity to see how much teachers agreed with themselves uh, on a five point scale of what the student should receive for a grade. So when a teacher, throughout the selection process, teachers also got some student responses that they had seen already. And so we were able to see when the teacher sees the student's response a second time, are they agreeing with themselves? And we saw that the, there was a pretty wide range that some teachers were uh, agreeing with themselves only 23% uh, above random chance of agreement of what the student should be getting and some all the way up to about 68% of agreement above random chance. So there's a wide range of, well, this time this teacher thought that the student got a zero, but the next time maybe the teacher thought they got a two. There is disagreement among themselves. And so why this is, what we found out when we, we questioned the teachers about why there may be this lack of agreement among, amongst students, or amongst teachers on what students should get for a grade, a lot of the teachers reference that there was more contextual information that's not being accounted for in this study about the students and uh, about uh, what they may be taking into account that they aren't by just randomly being assigned student responses. Uh, so that was something we took into account, which we will take into account in our modeling as well about the teacher grading difference. Excuse me. Uh, and then we then look at how, what is our ability to automatically grade these open responses? 
in mathematics. So we, again, we utilize the um, computer-based learning platform assessments where we look at only the open response questions. Now this content varies where it's not only online education resource material, but it is mostly online education material. So this consisted of data from Engage New York, Utah Math, and Illustrative Mathematics, asking questions similar to the one that I discussed earlier uh, that shows the explain your reasoning section. So we're taking data from there. To get the data in a form that we could use to model, we had to only do, we had to do a little bit of filtering where we removed any cases where it was an empty student response. Uh, the, the student either didn't write anything or they just didn't answer, we removed those. Um, and if we also removed any responses with just a single space character. Um, because on top, to what that may be signaling is that the student also attached an image to their answer, but we did not include image responses in this study. Uh, and so in the end, we had, this is what our final data set consisted of, about 141,000 total graduated students, our total, total graded student responses, 2,000 unique problems, 25,000 unique students uh, answered questions, and 891 unique teachers graded these problems. And this is a sample of what we were dealing with, with the type of responses that we had from students and what we had to look at, into with our natural language processing. Um, and as we can see here, there's a lot of uh, random capitalization thrown in there. There are little random text thrown in there. There's spacing differences between the students writing 2x or x2 or times 2, 2.5. There are a lot of different variations in the text we had to account for. And then we had the grade associated. So it was all authentic data that we obtained. Um, and so we performed natural language processing on this data. And we, there were two major steps that we had to take before we could start modeling. We had to tokenize the data, and then we had to give the words a numerical representation that our machine learned algorithms could take in and understand. We ended up utilizing what is uh, a common tokenizer called the Stanford tokenizer, which most tokenizers, what they do is they split where the spaces occur, and then they consider that a word. So like the would be a word, answer would be a word, couldn't would be a word. But what the Stanford tokenizer does is it does that, but also it takes couldn't and it splits it up into two separate words where it says could as one word and an apostrophe T as another word. Uh, it has little intricacies like that. I will discuss in a second here why we chose this one, but it splits the words. And we had two different approaches for representing the words. We used, uh, we started off by using a simplistic bag of words approach where we create a matrix of the unique words and how many times they occur. So it's just a count, a simple count of the word the was used 1,000 times, dog was used 100 times. Uh, and that this then is counted across each of the responses. However, this can then overweight words that are uh, occurring far too often, such as stop words, and we didn't want to remove them to keep our data set robust. Um, and so we utilized the TF-IDF, a term frequency inverse document frequency statistic, which essentially reweights this counted matrix to, sh to lower the weight of stop words or words that occur too frequently. The other approach that we use for representing the words that we've tokenized was to use word embeddings. Um, a common word embedding being GLOVE, also called, or also known as global vectors for word representations. Essentially, these Im word embeddings are generated, which then can be put on a vector space. And wherever these words are related relationally on the vector space, so if, however close they are to each other, those words are more similar, is what, the, what a word embedding is attempting to learn. And what you can do two things, you can either train it or utilize a pre-trained model. We, since our data set's not overly big and our responses aren't overly robust, we utilize a pre-trained uh, word embedding which was trained on Wikipedia. And because of this, we decided that this is why we use the Stanford tokenizer because when they trained GloVe on Wikipedia, they used the Stanford tokenizer. And for the machine to understand the words, 
it all it needs a numerical representation. So whatever words Glove has learned when it was pre-trained on Wikipedia, it will match it up with whatever words we have in our corpus. So if we had parsed using spaces, Stanford to the Glove would not recognize couldn't as a word, but it will recognize could and an apostrophe T as a word and be able to relate those to other words. In the end, we then develop uh, three different NLP models using, using uh, a random forest, XG boosting, and an LSTM. We uh, took these different approaches mainly for the fact of a random forest is a little less flexible, but it has the ability to uh, take in these TF-IDF vectors or values and be able to then easily parse apart a larger corpus of words. Um, and it's a, since it's less flexible, it may perform better on our data set size. We then increase the flexibility, moving towards an XG boost approach, uh, which is another tree-based approach that takes in the TF-IDF and classifies into the student grades. And then we wanted to make sure we take into account the sequencing of the words students use. So whether the student writes the order, so the order of the words is not being taken into account with this traditional machine learning technique. An LSTM will take into account the ordering of the words. And so does that sequencing of words matter? Uh, keep moving here. Uh, and we wanted to be able to fairly evaluate these models and being able to show that it's the text that is improving our ability to grade the students and not different uh, parameters such as the student's ability, um, the difficulty of the problem, or the variation in the teacher grading. Um, for this, we utilize the RASH model that takes in these different parameters that then will account on its own for the student ability and the difficulty of the problem and the teacher's strictness. So any improvement from those parameters in a RASH model is because of our ability to understand the text that students are submitting. Um, and so, again, as the base, since the base model doesn't observe text of a RASH model, we then ensembled the base rash model with all those all these different models I discussed here and all of the models were individually trained using a tenfold cross validation all were trained on the exact same tenfold cross validation um, and what we ended up finding was just by taking into account the parameters of the student's ability and the item difficulty we're able to classify the student student's grade with an AUC of 0.827, uh, so well above chance, uh, with an RMSC of 0.71 and a capital of 0.37. Um, once we incorporated the natural language processing models that we had developed using the random force, the XG boosting, and LSTM, all of these improved upon just accounting for the student's ability and the item difficulties, showing that we have uh, accurately been able to classify the student's grade um, using tenfold cross-validation and using natural language processing. Um, and so with our overall, our best result coming from a random forest model, which is then we take, or sorry, our RASH model with the random forest covariates, where we're taking in the, the RASH model takes in those number of words and the parameters of student ability and item difficulty along with the predicted covariates or predicted uh, probabilities of the random forest covariates. Um, and so we then wanted to make sure we looked at how well is our model able to grade the students given the amount of data that they have. When we, we decided to pull one example out here to show what is happening. So when we take our best model, the random forest uh, model that's classifying the grades and selecting the grades for students, what we can see is that the error rate is consistently going down, but when we hit a sample size of around 50 student responses, the random forest has not been able to improve significantly after. So more data is not impacting this model uh, in a positive way, it, it, it's in a significant way, showing up, telling us then that more data is not going to be more helpful on this problem with this model. We would need to change our approach and how we're modeling 
the language that the student is using. Uh, which we have in our work since, we have been able to already improve on this using some different ensembling methods. And in conclusion, uh, we have been able to uh, use utilize natural language processing to accurately grade student responses um, while utilizing a RASH model for the different parameters we discussed. Um, we also identified the case that we're able to identify cases where um, more data is not going to be helpful to our models, but we need to change our models. Um, and future work, we uh, the base model or the best model, our random forest, as I discussed earlier, isn't considering any sequencing, any structure of the text that students are using. Um, but we would want to try and incorporate that into our modeling. So that was why we attempted the LSTM, but the lack of data um, and the inability to, of the machine to understand certain words that are not in the pre-trained corpus. Uh, this hurt that LSTM. And right now, our team is currently trying to expand these pre-trained word embeddings that we have available to us to try and be able to understand more mathematical terms that aren't represented. Uh, and we're currently update, we keep updating our uh, grading model and are deploying it on assessments so that we, with the hope of being able to save teachers' times, save teachers time in assessing student work and being able to direct that additional time to help teachers. Uh, and sorry, I went a little over there, but that is it.